will move to who I will argue are the best presenting duo in all of Regen Agriculture. I always learn something awesome when they present and there is never a dull moment. Uh, so today, Steve Becker is Chief Science Officer at Titanio Biologicals. And in this role, he has afforded an up close and personal view into the world of soil biology, valuable information that he uses in the development and refinement of Titanio products. <laughs> <laughs> They're already goofing off. Uh, Dennis Warnicke is Director of Sales and Technical Support at Daniel Biological and a highly respected leader in biological agriculture. In his role, he helps distributors and growers build successful biological crop programs. Uh, I know they have a lot to share today. Please welcome Steve and Dennis. All right. Thanks, everybody. Soil biology and plant nutrition is what we're going to talk about today. And I'm Dennis. I'm Steve. And thanks, Sarah. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. That was awesome. I don't know who you were talking about, but I, I want to meet those guys. Let's see where this goes. <laughs> All right. So topics today, we're going to talk a little bit of a reality check. Uh, nutrition is key. We've been hearing all about that. Yep. We're going to talk about how that is made available to plant, and mm -hmm. we'll talk about the rise of phagy cycle. We're going to talk about nitrogens in different ways. Nit we can get nitrogen to the plant. Um, we're going to talk a specific example on wheat, mm -hmm. and then we're going to go in a little bit onto abiotic stress. So, Tanio Biologicals is all about living soils and living plants. I mean, we study and utilize functions of various microbial species and how these species interact together, and we put them in uh, together in a user-friendly form mm -hmm. that can be you know, tailor-made to looking at optimizing plant nutrition and plant yeah. balance. Phosphorus, nitrogen, drought stress, yeah. Exactly, and not only in the soil, but also in the foliar of the plant, mm -hmm. because that is critical yeah. in creating healthy plants um, and also healthy soil. So one of the things we always talk about is test, don't guess. Yeah. Um, you can have a great train wreck when it comes to overall plant for performance and also that biological community as everybody has talked about today by applying something that the plant does not need. Mm -hmm. So critical to have that information and with that let's get started and let's go in a little bit to doom and gloom. Mm -hmm. Yeah I hate to be a Debbie Downer here but we have to talk about this. We have to know where we've been in order to know where we're going I guess is Kind of the way I look at it. That's absolutely right. And I mean, sadly, the reality is, and this data is, you know, it's a few years old. This is from 97, so a few decades old. But if we look at most of the surface area of the earth and most of the areas that we are doing the majority of our agriculture and growth, we see that most of that area is either considered degraded or very degraded. Not so good. That's a little doom, a little gloom. And we can focus in on pretty much any country and do the same thing. This is average annual soil erosion by wind and water. Uh, and David was just talking about that massive loss that we're seeing. The, uh, the Gulf, Gulf of Mexico isn't a place that we grow a lot of plants. But man, it seems like we should because there is so much soil and nutrition getting dumped there. And again, we look at where do we grow most of our crops? Where's the bread basket? And these are areas that we're losing massive amounts of soil. I listened to David Montgomery and Ann DeClay here not too long ago, and they said modern agriculture degrades about an inch of soil every decade or two. And if we let nature run its course, it takes about 500 to 1,000 years for that inch of soil to be remade. But that's part of what we do and what regenerative agriculture is doing. It's taking this natural, this nature's time scale and compressing it down considerably. Uh, so the Midwest is eroding 10 to 1,000 times faster than it forms, and that's not great. Uh, when we look at our soil and we think about where does soil start and where does it end up, soil starts out as just bare rock, and bare rock is originally colonized by bacteria that are known as chemolithotrophs. They're microbes that digest the minerals with organic acids and enzymes directly from the rock, and we need to keep that in mind. Those bacteria are the first organisms that are going to colonize those environments to start that nutritional exchange and start that nutrition uh, release. So we like to think about this, and this is known as the primary secession, where we go from this bare rock where these microbes are slowly creating enough nutrition to start supporting a little bit of plant life. And the first plants there are lichen, which are basically just a combination of algae and bacteria 
And then as those photosynthesize and the microbes are breaking down more nutrition, we start to allow a little bit of soil to actually be formed. And we see some of these small annual plants and lichens, which moves on to grasses and perennials, grasses and shrubs. And then our climax communities are these shade tolerant trees. And not a lot of agriculture is done in this environment. Most of where we want our agriculture is in this grasses and perennials, grasses and shrubs. Unfortunately, our what we like to call destructive management practices are actually taking some of this soil quality and removing it, degrading it. We're er eroding some of that soil. We're losing that soil structure. We're compacting that soil. We're adding too much salt. We're doing a lot of things that take this normally productive soil and regress it back to a stage where we see more plants that are growing that we wouldn't want to see. And when we have a plant growing where we don't want to see it, we call that a weed. So we see more and more of these weeds popping up in our ag soil. The other side of that is regenerative management practices, and those were actually building our soil. And we like to think about this idea of primary secession as a maturity in the digestive system. Again, these bacteria are the first ones breaking down that rock. So they're starting this maturity. If you were to give a baby a milkshake, which is really nothing more than milk and sugar, it's already supposed to be eating that milk. It can't process that. It doesn't have the right organisms. It doesn't have the right enzymes. It doesn't have the digestive maturity to process that um, that nutrition. The same can be true in some of our ag soils. So when we're uh, transitioning from a conventional salt-based fertility system to a more regenerative, we've got to do things to build that digestive maturity back up. We want to move from this baby's digestive system. We want to get more into an adult's, into this teenage where we've got an adequate number of species, we've got diversity, and we've done as much as we possibly can to get this system to release nutrition that plant really needs. So we need to change it how we look at health. And like Dave was just talking about, this insect and disease, they're there for a reason. If we have done things to our soil, to our plants that are creating those incomplete proteins or that <clears throat> simplified reducing sugar, we're going to be attracting those organisms in because they're supposed to be there, aren't they, Dennis? Yes, they are. Yeah. And kind of the question arises, well, okay, so we've done all this bad. How can agriculture evolve to meet the demands of an increasing global population without compromising integrity of the environment? Hey, I know that. Okay, let's hear it. It might just be microbes. It just, and it's not just you saying that. Michigan State University researcher James Kremer agrees. And a big part of the reason for that is when we start looking at this soil environment, it's much like our digestive system. It should be chock full of all these different species, these beneficial species of organisms that are there. And just like in our gut, they are there to release that nutrition. We eat food and we are not very good at extracting nutrition. Same is true for the plant. So it needs these species. And a lot of what Tiny O Biologicals does is we manufacture what are known as plant growth promoting rhizobacteria or PGPR for short. And these provide many, many, many benefits to the plant. Um, they're producing extracellular polysaccharides, which are literally the glues that create that soil structure, that crumb structure that everybody wants. The aggregates are formed by these microbes. They're producing phytohormones. Uh, they're also producing antibiotics and enzymes that help protect that plant. And they can directly in, uh, impact and decrease the deleterious rhizobacteria. So those pathogenic organisms, they don't have a chance when some of these good guys are present. We're going to focus a little bit more on phosphate solubilization nitrogen fixation, and abiotic stresses, like Dennis talked about. Those are some of the topics we're going to hit on. And some of the benefits that we can see from these microbes, because we've got to have them, just like we were talking about that digestive capacity, as we increase those organisms, increase the complexity of that digestive system, we can do a lot more with that soil, can't we? Yeah, and you know, regenerative agriculture takes time. It, you know, and Sarah talked about that in that uh, chart that she put up, three or four years before you really start to see the benefit. Mm -hmm. And really what we're looking at here is how do we speed up that process yeah. like you talked about? How do we shorten that mm -hmm. window? And there's many things that we can do in regenerative agriculture to get there quicker. And I yeah. think Rick even talked about mm -hmm. that a little bit of changing maybe some of the things that he does. 
um, to just speed that process up. And we have to remember it is a process with multiple moving parts. Yeah. So it's not always easy to manage. You we can't have to pick have, one thing and be done. Exactly. We have to talk about teas or cover crops or inoculums or tillage animal component, all these things work together. And we find the more of these that we can put together, they all build upon themselves. That's stuff that's between your ears. Exactly. And these changes are not only going to be in the plant, but they're also going to be in the soil. And, you know, it's kind of that stair-stepping yeah. process. I think Dr. Hatfield talks mm -hmm. about that a little bit. And the other thing that I say is you can't skip a step on the stairs you know like you used to take two stairs oh, yeah. it's not one stair at a time as we build this process and they really need to be successful they need to be in the grower also yeah. the grower in order to be successful i look at myself as a conventional who is organic minded i mean i really think you have all the tools out there you need in order to be successful but you always pay attention in regenerative agriculture, if I do something to my soil to disrupt those organisms in that soil, for example, potatoes, you have to dig to get mm -hmm. them out of the ground. Well, we know we've disrupted that biological community. What do we need to do now in order to fix that? And you know, well, Rick this, put up a, a good point. This well, is the, the step seven. This is the commitment. Yeah. And, well, and it's a family commitment. It's a whole yeah. farm commitment. Mm -hmm. And it starts at the top. You know, and we have to, you know, there was good points put in there. It's not only the grower, it's the landowner. Yep. A lot of times a grower may not be the landowner. Mm -hmm. we got to get the landowner on board and educate them on an understanding of the benefit that they're going to see yep. based off of not only it's soil an investment. health, but yeah. exactly, an investment in the long-term crop. So we're going to talk about nutrition being key today. Oh, yeah. And, you know, David kind of talked about all of that nutrition is down in that soil environment. It's around that rhizosphere of that plant. We have all those beneficial bacteria and we're gonna talk about those nitrogen fixtures you see over in the left and the phosphate solubilers on the right and the ACC deanimase, these stress reducing mm -hmm. organisms up here. But they're all in that soil environment because as David said, the nutrition's there. That's where the mineral is. That is where it is. And these microbes need that nutrition in order to grow and reproduce. They're a living organism. They need it just like anything else. Yeah, and so does the plant. Yeah. So everything that we see in that soil that those microorganisms need, the plant needs in order to grow, to reproduce, mm -hmm. to actually get it through its stress periods, yeah. through its drought stress, through its... Um, saturated soil, all of these combinations that we see every day in agriculture are a process that can naturally go on naturally. Mm -hmm. And that's all what's needed for human health. And yep. you can see this picture up here on the left. If we're more biological minded, we're eating our fruits, we're eating our vegetables, naturally occurring within that soil environment, we naturally know we're going to be healthier. As we move away from that, we go more to the processed food, the chemicals, the synthetic we start to reduce our overall soil health. And that's kind of what we're talking about here today in this regenerative process, because you are what you eat. Are we trying to make a comparison of human health and digestive system to plant health and digestive system? You know, I've never heard that talked about, but maybe yeah. we should bring that up. I know, it's so smart. <laughs> But, but it, it, it is. It's, it's, it's all about the food. It's about the food. And like David was talking about, he had that wonderful video that's showing photosynthesis. It's all about photosynthesis. And it's all the base of this. And I'm, I'm going to say that most of these organisms um, that we're talking about, these PGPR, the mycorrhizal fungi, the plant growth enhancing fungi, uh, they're not photosynthetic. Yes, there are photosynthetic bacteria. We're not going to talk about those. Let's ignore those for now. Separate presentations. So for now, every one of those organisms needs something from the plant and it's this it's this big giant elephant in the room that's sugar it has to have sugar the plant is utilizing that sugar for everything the roots are made of sugar the leaves are made of sugar and that's in the form of celluloses hemicelluloses tannins lignans all these plant secondary metabolites the base of all of those is carbon we are carbon-based life forms and same with those microbes those microbes they need that sugar. They need that food from the plant. So when we follow the food, um, like David was talking about, we see that a lot of these exudates are coming out. And I liked his 75%. Uh, Some of the research I've seen, it's, it's on average all of the sugar that's produced by the plant, 25% or more, is sitting down and out through the roots as these exudates. Certain stages, 75%. I think incredibly, even these little, little tiny babies, little baby plants, these seedlings, 
30 to 40 percent. These are organisms that are just eking out survival, trying to survive, are still sending that much sugar to the root as an exudate. Isn't that just incredible? It is really, it, it's really incredible. And yeah. so why is so much of this energy put down into that soil environment? Well, I think the microbe guys are gonna say microbes. And it's, it's true, it's honest, because plants need help. Plants, just like our digestive system, we are not good at extracting the nutrition from our meal. Plant isn't either. They, you can give them lots of rock and mineral and that's not what they're great at. And then you can take it even further and say, well, let's look at nitrogen. Now, plants do not fix nitrogen. They have to have that biological component. So there are a lot of direct PGPR mechanisms and indirect PGPR mechanisms that are helping protect that plant, feed that plant, and allow that plant to grow, whether it's in a stressful environment, a good environment, um, or anywhere in between. We've got to have those organisms because as we'll talk about a little bit more later, they are essential for that plant's growth. And when we start looking at the exudate profiles, yeah, yeah, I know I said it's sugar, it's all about the sugar, it's all about the sugar. And that's true, but the reality is when we start looking, and this is a, a graph from Dr. Jill Clapperton, when we start looking at the exudate profiles of these plants, we see that every plant has its own it's like its signature smell it's like you know all the celebrities have their their signature perfume all these plants are kind of doing the same thing and this is just the overall broad spectrum of what those plants are doing the reality is day versus night hot versus cold um, whether it's spring or summer or fall it's fruit set it's vegetative all of these profiles are going to shift and change so this plant it's constantly shifting and changing those exudates that are coming out. Yeah, because these profiles are necessary for yeah. normal plant development mm -hmm. and plant growth. They have to have them. And you know, we talk about, I always talk about building habitat. Mm -hmm. And we have to build habitat in order to support life, yeah. both the plant above the ground and also that microbial community below the ground. And this kind of just shows that the plant, the microorganisms, and the soil are all tied together. We actually need to build all three of those systems within this, basically in that environment, mm -hmm. in order for it to be successful. So the plant will send out these exudates yep. and they'll recruit these specific microbial strains within that. And the microbial strains also will communicate with the plant that you'll talk about oh, a yeah. little bit later here in the presentation, Steve. And these also need that soil. The biology, as I said earlier, needs all that nutrition, all those minerals from that mm -hmm. soil environment in order to grow. And they put back their polysaccharides, the gomelian, back into that yep. environment to build that structure, that pore space, that oxygen uh, holding capability, kind of like Rick talked, the marbles within mm -hmm. that soil environment. Yep. And the plant actually puts organic matter back into that through its exudates, through field debris, through dead root mass, which again is a food source for that biological community to break down and make uh, basically for soil formation, mm -hmm. key formation, build organic matter, build yeah. soluble carbon. But when we start to talk, we always say these sugars, you know, they're much more than sugars. These metabolites that are exudated through these roots are a communication process. And they're not just okay. sugars, they're primary and secondary metabolites, which goes into not only overall plant health, but then we start to talk about the insect and the mm -hmm. disease and all of these things. You know, I always say that in order to be insect and disease free, you have to earn that right. And sometimes it takes time and it's getting this system functioning as designed because these exudates are actually there for recruitment. Yeah, it's, it's not an accident. The plant isn't just willy nilly sending this stuff down. It has a purpose and a big part of that purpose is literally to recruit the organisms as, that it wants. There's a lot going on and there are a lot of molecules and a lot of communication that's going on. Nematodes communicating with the bacteria, bacteria communicating with the plant, plant communicating with the nematodes. There's a lot going on, but I wanted to highlight one, and that's malic acid and how it relates to Bacillus subtilis. So this was research done on Arabidopsis, you know, that good old guinea pig of the research scientific plant world, where the researchers wanted to see what would happen when they threatened this plant, this Arabidopsis, with Pseudomonas syringii. And as they start to introduce the Pseudomonas syringii, the plant changes its exudate profile. It starts to increase the amount of malic acid it sends out and down through the root. And the researchers want to see, well, why? And lo and behold, 
The malic acid is a fantastic food and it's actually a recruitment tool. It's a molecule that these Bacillus subtilis want to eat. It's a direct food for them. So yeah, the Bacillus subtilis doesn't actually glow. This is a, a trick, the green fluorescent protein that these research genetically modified the Bacillus subtilis with. So we can see, we start seeing, this is the, the overall root here, the root hairs. And if you are a Pseudomonas syringii and you are trying to find an access point to that plant's root, now that all those Bacillus subtilis are present, it's pretty hard. Not only that, but like we talked about, these microbes are the primary digesters of nutrition, helping protect that plant. And it's just incredible, all this communication that's going on back and forth. And, and kind of speaking of that communication, it gets pretty deep. Yeah, but before we go any further, we need to have a talk. Uh, honey, we all, need to talk. Yeah, all of this we that we've talked some. about, the recruitment, the sugars, you know, why do the plants do it? And it really comes down to nutrient availability. Yep. And we're gonna go into a little bit of Dr. White's, mm -hmm. basically his research here. This is stuff Bruce talked about 30 years oh, yeah. ago. And it's so exciting for us to actually see this. The science is there. Exactly, right. come out and really talk about what is going on within that soil environment. And this starts right at the point of germination, kind of like what you talked about, those sugars being uh, shared with that right at germination where you, as you said, the little baby the plants. Babies, and these are little baby plants. And what happens when we sterilize, I mean, actually sterilize these seedlings, when we get rid of all of those organisms, and the researchers use streptomycin uh, in this case, these roots don't look normal, do they, Dennis? There's they, something not quite right there. And then we go over when the researchers allow even one of these beneficial organisms to be present we see that the root starts to grow in a normal way. And the biggest difference here is those root hairs. And we find out that those root hairs are a purposeful structure and the plant has to have them. And we're gonna talk a little bit about why, but when we do not have those organisms, the plant does not grow normally. Period, full stop, end of statement. They have to have them for this system to function. So you wanna describe this function, the system yeah, a little bit better, Dennis? I mean, I mean it, it comes down to the bottom of this uh, root meristem you see right here. Those are the exudates that we talked about, that communication oh, that's yeah. going on between that plant with that micro, mm -hmm. microbial community within that soil environment. It's there, like you said, with the malic acid to yeah. attract specific organisms within that soil environment to bring them into the plant. And then it does something a little sneaky. <laughs> it lets them yeah, out <laughs> right up inside that root. You can see the purple and the blue. Those are all bacteria and fungal with uh, fungi within that root structure. And then it gets even more sneaky where it bombards them with reactive oxygen. This kind of breaks down the cell mm -hmm. wall of that uh, beneficial bacteria within that root structure and it makes them leaky. It kind of wrings them out, takes all of that nutrition out of them, and then it spits them back out into the soil environment. So they're kind of like a hungry bear coming out of hibernation where all of that nutrition that's in that soil environment now is that they need, they use it to rebuild their cell walls, they go back into that digestion process. Yeah, and the whole process starts over and over again. And what's amazing is this research is also showing that those root hairs are developed mainly because of the idea of that's how they put those back out so into a little that syringe soil environment. Yeah. yeah, Bruce used to talk about plant health the key to uh, mineral nutrition basically was these microorganisms yep. within that soil environment. Mm -hmm. And that's really what it comes down to. I mean, they're there to digest and make that nutrition available. That's what the they're food. good at. That's what they want Chemolithotrophs. to do. Chemolithotrophs. That's what they've been doing since the beginning. Exactly. But it doesn't stop here. If we start to look at this, these microprotoplasts are replicated within the root cells. So many clones of the internalized microbes are now made. So not only does the plant, through its exudates, attract these beneficial mm -hmm. organism. It then brings them in and to digest them. And it says, you know what? It baits the trap. Yeah, I want more phosphorus. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna clone these phosphate solubilizers yep. and I'm gonna spit more of you guys out into that soil environment so I can get more phosphorus. And that's really what it, you know, it kind of comes down here. You can see again that malic acid and that recruiting mm -hmm. process around those hairs. Now we know on those little, uh, uh, feeder roots, those little hairs coming off of that plant that they are being spit back out yep. into that through that hair formation. And down here on the bottom right, this is a corn plant and you can kind of see this 
when I start to see this kind of root mass where we have those dreadlocks or, yeah. or the roster roots where we have all of that microbial community growing right around that root structure, David showed some as just a little baby just starting. Mm -hmm. um, we see all these little fine root hairs where we know now not only are we putting those organisms back into that soil environment, we're mining more of that soil for that nutrition mm -hmm. to bring back into that plant. And it's just, it's really amazing when you start to see it, but when you look at these organisms within that soil environment, you can kind of see a little bit what that reactive oxygen does to kind of break them down and oh, tell yeah. the story. No, this is what's going on. This is a rod shaped bacillus and it's a bacillus subtilis, so we can see that it has a defined shape. It's kind of a pill shape, actually, and that's because it has the cell wall while it's in this form. Just like your plant cell uses its cell wall to maintain its shape and maintain rigidity, this micro, this bacteria, is doing the same thing. The presence of that bacteria and some of the communication molecules that bacteria uses, the plant signal, uh, the plant recognizes, and that's what stimulates the superoxide, the reactive oxygen species, the superoxide to be uh, produced by the plant and put into that root environment. And then this is what happens. This is what Dennis was talking about. You can see some of these are still whole, but they've swollen up. They look kind of weird. And some of them pop. The ones that pop, they, they're dead. They die. And now they are, every bit of that microbe is then food for the plant. It's just incredible, and it's not just bacteria. Mycosomes, that's the form when we talk about when fungi have entered, and the same thing is happening. It's partially digesting that, it's breaking down some of its cellular structure and allowing it to become leaky. So it, I like to think about these, when we look at them, the, these cocci, these round shapes, the rod shapes, they look like supplements, they look like food, they look like pills, and we can think about them that way. When you look at the overall nutritional profile of most bacteria, and this is a gross generalization, but they're roughly a 10 to 2 plus trace minerals. And the strains of bacteria are unique in terms of the nutrients they provide to the plant. So if I have a nitrogen fixing bacteria, in this case it shows E. coli, it's a 15. Rather than a 10, it's a 15. And some of these nitrogen fixing bacteria can be even higher. If the plant, like Dennis talks about, needs more phosphorus, it's going to stimulate and grow more phosphate solubilizing. So rather than a 10-2-2, this might be a 10-8-2. Same with potassium, same with calcium. These organisms have different capacity because just like different plants, they have different needs. They have different requirements for their growth. So when you start talking about this nutrient acquisition, it is incredible, like these little tiny babies. And this is a, a stressful environment, and they need that extra nutrition, don't they? Yeah, this was actually during the drought in Washington State a couple years back. This was a dryland wheat farmer that went ahead and drilled his wheat. Was mm -hmm. There was supposed to be a rain, didn't get the rain he wanted, didn't get the moisture, went out there and dug up these plants, and he sent me these pictures here on the left, and he was like, where's the moisture coming? Yeah. Where is the nutrition coming for these guys to get up and going? It's dry. And, yeah. And he, it was amazing. Then later on, you can see st they had had one light rain, but the root mass on this was just incredible of what he was seeing uh, for his crop to perform. And again, we'll talk a little bit more about the nitrogen later. There was no additional nitrogen mm -hmm. put here because he was a little worried about the lack of moisture yeah. within that soil environment. So we'll, you know, we'll talk about how that all happens, how that tax takes place here in a minute, but it all comes down to nutrition availability to get these guys up and started, especially when we start to talk about root development. Well, and just like we saw with that streptomycin treated, um, environment where we don't have microbes. It's as simple as when we don't have these bacteria, the plant has access to less nutrition because it's eating them. It is literally eating those supplement pills. And we can see that, yep, when we have these microbes, we have higher phosphorus. When we look at calcium, potassium, magnesium, sulfur, we see the same thing. No bacteria versus with bacteria. And like I mentioned, even different species uh, subspecies of the same organism can have different capacities for extracting different nutrients. So this example, this bacillus, is much better at extracting potassium out of the soil and then feeding it to the plant than this one is. And we can go on. We see it with manganese. We see it with zinc. And we want to spend a little bit more time talking about nitrogen, partially because we all know what happened with nitrogen last year, but it's a little bit deeper than that. We want to focus on nitrogen because 
it can become problematic, can't you know, it? Yeah, you know, we, we were talking about nitrogen earlier here, and you talk about the cost of nitrogen, just the raw cost for one pound of nitrogen. Oh, yeah. A lot of times what I look at is what is the cost of excessive nitrogen within yes. that plant beyond just the cost mm -hmm. of nitrogen. When we start to, we've heard a lot today about the cost associated with insecticides, mm -hmm. fungicides, herbicides. We're feeding those weeds when we put that excessive nitrogen out there. So I always say we try to avoid going down the aisle of death. Yeah. Um, we all know nitrogen is critical, period. We need that for growth. We Every have organism. To there. But we also have to look at the research that's coming out. We have to look at the form of mm -hmm. the nitrogen that we're using. And there's a lot of research. Dr. Huber's talking about it. Dr. White, David Canals has talked about it. Dr. Dykstra has talked about it. All of John John's talked, talked about, about it. it. The list yeah. goes on. All of, these, all of the problems that excessive nitrogen cause. And we talk about that when we say tests don't guess. This mm -hmm. comes down to anything. I've always said an excess of anything causes a much greater problem than a deficiency. Deficiencies are generally easy to fix. Uh, excess may take multiple applications, again, cost, mm -hmm. to actually really fix the problem that we created on our own. So we have to look at not only how that affects based off cost, but also that nitrate applications are excessive, shuts down just what we were talking about, the, the rise of the cycle, yep. the whole entire system. So now we're not getting those nitrogen fixtures, we're not getting all those trace minerals, we're not getting that phosphorus, all the things that you just talked about that are in those microbial communities, in their bodies, in mm -hmm. their cells that that plant is digesting, are no longer available. So we really need to kind of take a look at that. And you know, I say form of nitrogen is key. A big difference. Why don't we just let the biology? Well, let's talk about biological nitrogen then and biological nitrogen fixation. And when we start down the biological nitrogen fixation path, the first thing we talk about is rhizobia. That's what everybody knows. In general, it's estimated that microbial nitrogen accounts for roughly 30 to 50% of total nitrogen in crop fields. And that's not from a long time ago, that's from 2017. So that is still the case in ag today. So utilizing these organisms is critical. And the reason that the rhizobia are such an incredible thing um, is because of the amount of nitrogen they can fix. Um, and like Rick was saying, 78% of the atmosphere above us is nitrogen. Unfortunately, it's triple bonded nitrogen that's extremely difficult to break apart. It takes a specific enzyme known as nitrogenase. And nitrogenase is extremely sensitive to oxygen. If it's exposed to oxygen, it shuts down, it breaks, it doesn't work anymore. And the other side of that, like Dennis was talking about, when we apply nitrogen, it shuts down rhizophagy. A big part of the reason for that is, and that's the case with calcium, with phosphorus, with anything else, if we apply it and it's available, the plant is not going to spend the energy to pay somebody else to do this. Nitrogen fixation, you get about 36 ATP from the TCA cycle, the Krebs cycle, um, like uh, David was talking about. As we run through that process and we break that sugar down and we're forming that adenosine triphosphate, ATP is basically the energy driver, like little microscopic batteries. Half of that is going to go to nitrogen fixation. So it is extremely energy dependent. It is the most energy dependent process, biological process that occurs in the animal kingdom. It's just incredible how much energy it takes. So if a plant doesn't have to do it, if a microbe doesn't have to do it, it's not going to. So the reason that this nodule structure is so incredible is it gives a house for these rhizobia. The plant can just flood this environment with all the sugar it could possibly need. And this structure has oxygen scavenging molecules that sucks the oxygen out. The reason that these nodules are pink is there's a hemoglobin-like molecule, an iron-containing molecule, that sucks the oxygen out to help protect it. Rhizobia are really, really cool. There are lots of them. They're available for products. But what I really wanted to focus on is, like I talked about, the energy requirements of that nitrogen fixation. When researchers combine a phosphate-solubilizing bacteria, in this case, Bacillus megatherium, with these rhizobia inside the nodule, they saw a 31.1% increase in nitrogen fixation compared to the rhizobia alone. So utilizing multiple species can give us a huge boost to our crop yield, our crop performance, even in legumes. 
Just like we talk about cover cropping, diversity is diversity. better, brings in those different. The same holds true when we're talking about inoculums. A or micro organisms. cover crop. Exactly. Absolutely. And we're seeding it. The oh, same yeah. thing. They're little tiny seeds. But we can go beyond that because not everybody's growing legumes all the time. If I'm growing wheat, I'm growing corn. That doesn't help me very much except for the cover crop that I did before. But there's also a group of organisms that are known as free living nitrogen fixers. And these are bacteria that can grow out in the soil. They can grow in the bulk soil. You're going to find most of them right around that root. And there's a few reasons for that. The biggest reason is where's the sugar come from? Where's, where's the candy jar? The candy jar is right next to that root. That plant is providing the sugar. And again, because we're in this bulk soil environment, or we're in that rise of sheath, oxygen becomes a bit more of a concern. So what these microbes do is they take that sugar from the plant and they massively ramp up their metabolic activity. And in doing so, they soak up and they use up the oxygen that is there so that that nitrogenase is protected. And speaking of nitrogen fixation nitrogenase, we have to make sure we're supplementing with iron, molybdenum, vanadium, chromium. Those are critical nit nickel. Uh, nickel for urease breakdown. We have to have that for the enzymes. So an easy way to get that is pretty much anything from the ocean. Doing some kelp is going to help feed that. You yeah, know, and I always look at when I'm talking to a grower, the rhizobium is plant driven. Mm -hmm. Basically, where the free living yep. nitrogen, that nitrogen fixation is mm -hmm. basically microbial driven. Yep. And that's really what we want to talk about. We can have nitrogen fixing bacteria on the corn, on the wheat, oh, just yeah. like you said. It's just microbially driven rather than plant driven. Yep. And it's not just the roots. We can see these organisms growing in different parts. It's organisms known as endophytes. Endo mean inside and phyte is plant. So these are bacteria and fungi that can grow inside of the plant. And it's not just in an isolated small area. I like this little call out because it shows these bacteria and these fungi growing throughout the plant. And it's not just the root, it's not just the stem. You can have those organisms in the leaves. And if we're doing it right, we can spray with a nitrogen fixing, an endophytic nitrogen fixing bacteria on the phylosphere of our plant. And research, especially by Dr. White, is showing that the trichomes in those leaves are a site of nitrogen fixation, which just blows my mind. So if we're not excessively applying nutrition that we want to be biologically available, we can encourage that plant to be synthesizing and producing nitrogen for itself. In crops like Hops. Hops. In hops like, in groups like corn. corn. And we're going to talk a little bit about wheat right now. Yeah, this was, a, a, it's actually interesting. This was in the Palouse, and I, I just, I had a grower sees hope. Uh, this is a grower that has looked at the idea of no-till. Yep. He's starting to do cover crops. He wants to greatly reduce the amount of nitrogen because he's trying to build soil health. He does not want to burn up his carbon. Yep. He wants to build uh, better organic matter. He wants mm -hmm. that digestive system process to work uh, as designed, I guess, to availability. Get out of nature's crop. way. Exactly. <laughs> and so his average program, 110 pounds of nitrogen. This year was a heavy, wet, cool spring. There was rust ran rampant throughout the Pacific Northwest. Yeah. Two applications of fungicide and one application of insecticide, insecticide yielded 100 bushel per acre, mm -hmm. right on the average. I think this field was right at 196. Um, the biological, we use uh, Spectrum NFB, which is nitrogen, uh, fixing. nitrogen fixing, and then we also use 37 pounds of total nitrogen. A little at plant and a little later on during out the growing season. A little more um, than a third. Yep. Uh, the, the amazing part about this, there was no fungicide needed on this field and no insecticide. And it never, I'm not saying there wasn't any there. It, they kind of saw signs of it, but it just never developed into anything, never met that economic threshold. Mm -hmm. Never, as the grower said, I never worried about it. Um, so again, we talk about cost savings. Remember I talked about nitrogen and the problems nitrogen can cause. Yeah. yeah. So we're still finding tune in the system. Remember we talked about environment and expression. Mm -hmm. We talk about what happens when we start to change that soil environment and build that digestive system. One of the things I had noticed is uh, cheatgrass was a real problem this year, again, also in the Pacific Northwest. And in this because, field in yeah, particular. Because of the, uh, all the moisture. I asked a grower about the cheatgrass one day, we were standing there talking because I didn't see any in this field. And he said, predominantly three years ago before we headed down this biological or regenerative path, 
um, this was his worst field for cheatgrass. And now cheatgrass is just not a problem anymore um, in this field. And it was, as we say, it's a program. It's not a product that gets you, as I say, earning the right mm -hmm. um, to be insect disease. And, you know, weeds, you're not weed free. They just change yeah. as you build your overall Changing soil Changing the health. environment. Yeah. But it's really exciting. Some of the pictures we saw we took here. He, I mean, this white stuff that he's seeing down in the soil. He used to be afraid of. Yeah. I mean, great fungal community going on within that soil environment. Mm -hmm. The roster roots that we talk about, oh, yeah. those microbial communities. It's much deeper. All, yeah. yeah, deeper down within that root zone. All of these things that we want to see in this agriculture practice, the regenerative process, he's starting to see. And just a few pictures of, you know, the up here 920, this was a winter wheat. He said that this was his best looking winter wheat going into the fall. On 525, you can see this was when we did a foliar mm -hmm. application based off of plant sap analysis. Um, then 725, another picture. And then obviously this is 818. This is when we put the combine into the field and started the harvest. But is there a breaking point? Can you push this system too far? Kind of oh, like yeah. what Sarah talked about is, you know, you see that crash and then you start to climb back mm -hmm. out. And this was a grower that went in full, no nitrogen. We're gonna go full biological. Uh, standard program was 38 pounds of nitrogen. He had a nitrogen credit from the year before, so that's what he decided to use. Yielded 55.1 bushel to the acre. On the biological side, we used the nitrogen fixing bacteria spectrum and two and a half pounds of nitrogen. That came from fish and soy protein, micro food and micro food. nitrogen. Yeah. And we yielded 45.1 bushel. The amazing part about this is you can see this is a picture of the standard and the biological program. That's a separation line right there. Um, was that we only, we lost yield at tillering. It yeah. was a cool wet spring in this area. Uh, we didn't have the temperatures we needed to really kick the biological community. Again, this was a conventional field, uh, predominantly anhydrous, that we went mm -hmm. into with this biological community. So we were just getting a start with this biology in there, which also may have set us back just a little bit of getting the performance that we needed. Um, but the amazing part was when we pulled the plant sap analysis on June 23rd. Thanks, April. Cool. Thanks, yeah, David. The biological compared to the standard, the biological program had more phosphorus. It had to more total nitrogen. It had more potassium, more calcium, more iron, more zinc, more manganese, more, more molybdenum, right down the board. Silicon, the only, iodine, boron. Yeah, oh, the yeah. only thing we didn't have more, there was three things we didn't have more of. One was sodium. One okay. was chloride and one was aluminum. I'll take it. Yeah. So this was obviously in June, um, late June. Uh, but it was exciting to see that without all that additional nitrogen, once that temperature mm -hmm. kicked in and that biological community was functioning, that nitrogen was made available. The plant had all it needed. We just lost a little bit early. And, you know, it kind of comes down to when we talk about stresses, so often we talk about drought stress. But yeah. we also can have stress from too much moisture. Mm -hmm. We can have environmental stresses. But let's talk a little bit about drought stress, Steve. So, yeah, when we're talking about those non-living stresses, abiotic stresses, these microbes, these PGPR, have an incredible role to play out in your fields. And we can utilize them to do a lot of things for us. So when the plant becomes stressed, it's going to need more energy. Phosphate solubilizers, like we already saw and we already talked about. The plant can call out for more of those phosphate solubilizers than through rhizophagy, can feed them, encourage them, attract them, and they can do their job. These microbes can also, when they're sensing that, that soil moisture getting low, they're gonna change the phytohormones that they produce because these organisms will directly produce phytohormones themselves. And they can change the cytokinins, cyto cytokinins, they can change the endolacetic acid. And in doing so, they're purposefully changing the root morphology. They're changing how that root grows. Um, these microbes are producing antioxidants to help protect the plant. When the plant is running out of moisture, it has trouble removing some of those reactive oxygen species from itself. Uh, osmotic stress starts to become a problem. So these microbes are producing osmolites that help directly protect some of the cellular machinery of the plant and help that plant hold on to more of its water. I think this is pretty incredible. Volatile organic compounds. Just basically the breath, the smell of those microbes, the gases that they're exuding off have, a, have an impact on how that plant's genes react. 
HKT1 is a gene cluster that's responsible for moving sodium from the roots, from the shoots down and out through the root. Okay, great. Now we just have more sodium down in our soil. Well, again, these microbes have a response for that. The extracellular polysaccharides, EPSs. I like to think about those. If you're building a brick structure, you want to put the bricks together, how do you hold them together? Use some mortar. That's what this EPS is. It's taking that sodium and the microbe can bind that sodium inside of the mortar, inside the EPS, that takes it out of that environment, takes it out of that system. So these microbes are doing a lot. And again, they are tiny. They are down in the soil and they have a very sensitive system to determining how much moisture is available because they're a living system. If they sense that the moisture levels are going down, they're going to signal to the plant, hey, 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 you better slow down. You better be careful because we're running out of moisture. These, these microbes, they want to survive. They want the plant to survive because that's their gravy train. That's where they're getting their food from. So not only are they sending communication up to the stomata of the leaves, they're also increasing the potassium availability for the plant. Both of these are helping the plant close its stomata more quickly, holding on to more moisture, which is just incredible. And Dennis mentioned ACC deaminase a little bit earlier. Rhizobacteria capable of producing ACC deaminase may mitigate salt stress in wheat. ACC deaminase is going to literally decrease the ethylene levels. Ethylene is used by plants is basically, it's, it's hurry up, we got to get there. It's, it's stress modulating. Uh, and I mean, I know that's an oversimplification, but that's how I want to think about it right now. So utilizing this ethylene, the plant is using it to force itself into reproduction because it wants to get to the finish line. If it is too stressed and it can't reproduce, it's done. So it's going to do what it can to hurry up and get to that reproductive stage. These microbes are directly decreasing the amount of ethylene, whether it's through salinity, drought, flooding, heavy metals, chilling, or pollutants, these microbes producing ACC deaminase are directly decreasing the ethylene and therefore decreasing the stress levels of the plant, plus all these other benefits. So it is just incredible all the things that these microbes are doing. And we can see it in the field real quick, can't we, Dennis? Yep, real quick, I would love to have this entire story that went on here. I spent a couple days out in Kansas with a field scout. Just to give you the Reader's Digest version of this, picture on the left basically is Corn that did not get completely That's pollinated. That's what most of the corn looked this like. This was what thousands and thousands of acres looked like. I saw a ton of pictures like this. On the right, basically, is a grower we were visiting who has been using um, basically these regenerative practices for many years. Mm -hmm. Below, you see a picture of his corn. This was actually also, not only was there heat that it had a hail storm yeah. in addition on this. A little bit um, of stress. A little bit of stress, but... What the field scout had noticed is through this biological basic system, what we were talking about, the str drought stress reducers within that soil environment and the fact that it had better nutrition. It came down to calcium. You know, David talked about calcium. Bruce always used to refer to calcium as the stopping guard. He determined who went where, who came in, who mm -hmm. came out. Calcium has a lot of functions within the front, but it's critical based off of cell development. Yeah. And one of the things the field scout noticed was the idea that these fields here that produced well, the pollen tubes did not collapse when they got that heat stress early on in the growing season. And this is all irrigated mm -hmm. corn. This wasn't dry land, this was irrigated corn. And they still saw that heat stress on the plant where on these fields over here on the left, those pollen tubes were all collapsing. And therefore we did not get complete. That's silage. Yeah. Oh, mo a lot of it was cut as silage. In fact, I was really sad because right next to the field you see of the great green picture, there was another field that I was going to get a picture of a side-by-side. -side. They cut the other field that day before we got back <laughs> to get the picture, so we didn't get to see it. So if you can sum it up real quick. Get the friends out there, however you choose to do this regenerative process. Yeah. That there's a lot of ways. Rick talked about it. It's different for every mm -hmm. grower. You know, get yourself with like-minded growers. Get the experts out there. Talk to AEA. Talk to us. Talk to Dave. Talk to all the people that are here. Yes. Gather as much information as you can based off equipment, crop, rotation. Put those things into practice because you can only, the plant can only use the tool if it can access it. Yep. So with that, we'll go to questions and... Thanks, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> All right.
Okay, good stuff as usual. Let's jump into some questions here. Uh, man, I want to stop and read your read your comic, but I'll read questions instead. Okay, do you need uh, to to do many equipment modifications for application of biologicals? You know, I, a lot of times when I start working with a grower, I find out what equipment they have. We have a conversation of how we can best implement it. As Rick uh, talked about, we don't want to go out and buy a bunch of new equipment. Sometimes it makes sense to modify it. Mm -hmm. I tell you, farmers are unbelievable. When I give them an idea of how they need to do something, they modify their equipment to do exactly what it needs to do. So yeah, we'd love to see in furrow application of these organisms. We want direct soil to see yeah. contact. We talk about um, germination is key and we could talk about reduction of stress and yield and all those things, but I won't take up that time. So no, we don't need to modify equipment. Let's work with what you have and get started. Love that. Make it easier at first. Okay. How do we manage excessive nitrogen availability? Well, stop applying. So yes. <laughs> stop the gravy train. And, <laughs> and then if, if we look at plant sap analysis yeah. and we have information, there are some things we can apply to that crop to slow down that process or convert it. So that would be kind of, we'd need data and information, but yes, if there is too much, there are things we can apply. As I said, when we have an excess, a lot of times we have to do two or three things to fix what that excess mm -hmm. is. And it varies based off a of crop and based off of plant sap analysis, but there are things that can be done. Yes. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Uh, this is like lightning round. Okay, guys. Uh, can, <laughs> can fish hydrolysate help to drive mycorrhizal fungal growth? Fish hydrolysate, I, fats, I, but, oils. But as far as mycorrhizae go, generally oh. mycorrhizae are associated with the plant exudates. So mycorrhizae generally need a plant, a living plant. So I don't associate a lot of the foods that we put out and we call microbe foods as mycorrhizal foods so much as like the PGPR because those mycorrhizae generally need a direct plant connection. Well, and so, as we talked about with too much nitrogen, yeah. um, shutting down the rise of yeah. too much phosphorus can do the exact same thing. So if you're not seeing um, a good uh, infection of mycorrhizae with your plants, uh, a lot of times it can be phosphorus levels within that soil environment, which is Basically, the plant doesn't need it, so it doesn't put out the signal to create that infection or their relationship with it. So, so indirectly, yes, because fish hydrolysates are going to feed the microbes and feed the plant, which is going to increase photosynthesis, which is going to increase mycorrhizae. And mycorrhizae helper bacteria. Oh, yeah. Okay. We got, we got there. Yeah, good answer. All right. When salts are tied up by EPS, will they sh still show on a soil test or set? Sat paste test? Uh, so the saturated paste that should still be bind up because it's physically inside of that structure. If you're doing like the total digestion, that's gonna show you everything that's there. It's not magic, it's not gone. It's just not as available in the system. So I would expect it to, I would expect to still see it in some analysis, but less so in the paste extracts. And you wanna add? Mm. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, can plants communicate to soil biology what their nutritional requirements are? Yes. Next question. Yeah, yeah no, there's, <laughs> there's a lot going on. And I mean, honestly, we're, I say we, but just science in general is starting to speak the language. I mean, I mentioned malic acid. Um, I do another pre, I talk about benzoxazenoids that communicate with Pseudonus petita. There are molecules that we're starting to recognize and have a better understanding of, but it's like, it's a different language. It's learning a new language, and I don't even know if we have the full alphabet yet, so we're just starting to understand, but oh, abs absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like the, what Dr. White talks about is them recruiting them in and then basically cloning them with inside that plant to spit them back out into that environment to get more of what the plant needs. Yeah. And uh, Dr. White does talk about that a mm -hmm. little bit of just starting to understand that communication process. Well, and the ones that don't work as well, the plant won't replicate. They don't have the same cycle. They don't have the same pathway inside, inside of the roots. It. So the plant might take in 50 different species and it's only going to really amplify 25 of those. And I'm making up those numbers, but it, it is needs. selective. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. 
Great. And then I, I can't see the chat out there from where I am, from my world over here. But if anybody has um, shared James White's uh, information or anything, we might want to add that to the chat because you guys keep referring to him and he is pretty amazing. Uh, that's um, very cool stuff. So yeah, know. we'll make sure we share that. Uh, and then uh, next question from the audience. I'm applying compost already. Do I need to do more to inoculate my soil? Well, generally, I would say yes, depending on your soil environment. Compost is only diver uh, as diverse as basically what that compost is coming from. Mm -hmm. So what is it? I mean, what is, what is the makeup of that compost? And you also have to remember that through that composting process, we lose some of those beneficials. So then we have to build them back up within that soil environment. So a lot of times what I see is when the guys are putting out that compost, based off of history and what we're trying to achieve within that soil environment yes you can add a inoculum maybe at a light rate a half rate something like that just to diversify that within the soil environment just like i would recommend with compost tea you get all the benefits of the compost tea let's put a known set of organisms within there and we get a little more consistency out of its benefits so yeah and part of the composting cycle should be raising that temperature because you're wanting to deactivate seeds as well as pathogens, pathogens. The hard part there is not all of our, mes the, the mesophilic bacteria, the ones that live in the middle, the meso um, temperatures, they're thermophilic. And those are usually what are gonna cycle up when you have those high temperatures. So we are gonna see some casualties. So I would expect the diversity to change some in compost. Compost is, good compost is a fantastic, fantastic. input, but not all compost is good compost. So be, be careful, make sure you get analytical work on your compost. If the company doesn't have it, you better find it. Or, or find test it yourself. Or test it, yeah. Okay, that was gonna be my next question. How do we find good compost soap? That's great. Okay, I think that wraps up our Q&A time. We will speak to you gentlemen in just a little while as we when we do our um, all speaker roundup, but thank you so much for a super informative presentation. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks everybody.